Today we're going to start talking about two-person general sum games. Uh, to begin with, what is a two-person general sum game? Well, we can define it in strategic form in the following way. We have two sets, X and Y. These are just like we had when we were talking about two-person zero-sum games. But now, uh, let's see, X and Y tell you the strategies for player one and player two, respectively. But now we have two separate real-valued functions. One of them, U1, will tell the, the return for a particular pure strategy choice of little x by player one and little y by player two. And this is the return for player one. We have a totally separate function, U2 of x and y, which tells you the return to player two with those same strategy choices, x for player one and y for player two. So this uh, pair, x, y, is in the... Uh, <clears throat> Cartesian product, x times y, of these sets. This is called the strategic form of the game. We're not going to be talking about the extensive form of the game. These were discussed a bit in parts of uh, part two of the book, which we didn't cover. So we'll just be talking about the strategic forms, and that's really all that will be necessary for us. By all means, you should read those sec those parts of the sections. Uh, which cover the extensive forms of the game. Note that these functions, u1 of xy and u2 of xy, will always represent returns to the individual player, in this case to player 1 or to player 2. Positive numbers are good for player 1 if they're in u1, and positive numbers for u2 are good for player 2. We're no longer going to have this type of convention as we did with two-player zero-sum games, that a positive number re represents a payout from one player to another. Instead, both players can get positive payouts, so that would just mean U1 and U2 can be both positive at the same time, or both players can get negative payouts. They can both be negative, or of course you can have any other combination, positive and negative, zeros, all sorts of things. <clears throat> We can represent these two functions, u1 and u2, in the following way. You tell me a choice of row i, or say little x sub i, from the set x of, of strategic possibilities for player 1, and a choice of y sub j from the set capital Y, a choice of uh, a pure strategy for player 2. You tell me those choices. And we have this pair, u1, u2, which tells us how much player 1 gets and how much player 2 gets. We can represent that by looking for each possibility, i equals, <coughs> or which each possibility, say i equals 1 to m and j equals 1 to n, where, say, x is the set x1, x2, through x of m, and y is the set y1, y2, through y sub n, and then we can create a matrix, an m by n matrix. Which at each entry gives you an ordered pair. At each entry it tells you for, in this case, choice 1 for player 1 and choice 1 for player 2, it tells you there's a pair 0, 1, meaning player 1 gets 0, player 2 gets 1. If, for example, player 1 plays row 3, and player 2 plays column 1, we have this pair negative 1, 2. So player 1 gets a return of negative 1, and player 2 gets a return of positive 2. So <clears throat> this whole formulation works for finite two-player general sum games. Finite, just like before, means that the sets X and Y of choices for the two players are finite sets. Then we can represent the strategic form of the game uh, as a what we call a bimatrix, a matrix of ordered pairs. Now, from this matrix of ordered pairs, we can separate out the payments to pay player one and the payments to player two. So this matrix that I'm calling A is player one's payout matrix, and it just tells you at each point in the matrix, or for any pair i and j, in this case from one to three, i goes from one to three, j goes from one to three, for each entry in the matrix, what is player one's payout? We just take the first coordinate of each entry 
in the buy matrix. And this matrix B just tells you the payout to player 2, given the strategy choices for players 1 and 2. It's the second coordinate of each entry in the buy matrix. How can we have at least any idea of how the players should play in such a in such a two-player general sum game? Well, let's talk about what are called safety levels. This is the exact same game we had before. We have the matrix A representing player one's payouts and the matrix B representing player two's payouts. We might ask the question, if you're player one, what's the largest amount that you can guarantee to receive? Well, that's a similar question that we had when we looked at two-player zero-sum games. We look at these payouts for player one, and we can ask what is the value of this game if it were a two-player zero-sum game? Because that would answer what number, the value of the game, can I guarantee for myself regardless of what the other player does? Now, we know that the entries don't represent the payout from player two to player one, but it doesn't matter. They represent the amount player one gets, and we're only asking about how much player one gets. So if player one plays an optimal strategy in this matrix thought of as a two-player zero-sum game, we know that player one can guarantee at least that value by playing that same optimal strategy, and it could be a pure strategy or it could be a mixed strategy. Now, I've chosen very simple matrices here for this example. <clears throat> can we solve this game for player one easily? The answer is yes. I claim that this number one here is actually a saddle point of the matrix. It's the smallest number in the row, and it's the largest number in the column. So what does that mean? That means that player one, by playing row two, can guarantee at least one. That's very clear. And there's no better number that player one can guarantee, since if player two plays column one, one is certainly the best player one can do. So we say that the safety value for player one is one, and the strategy to achieve this is just to play row two. It happens to be a pure strategy because there was the saddle point there. Now things are just a little trickier when we talk about player two, because we can't just look at this matrix B and say, treat this like a <coughs> like a matrix for a two-player zero-sum game for player two. Why? Because if we were to treat it like a zero-sum game, all the entries would be returns from, uh, sorry, payments from player two to player one. So how can we uh, deal with that? Well, I claim if we want to find player two safety level, we can just look at the new matrix, B transpose, which you get from interchanging rows and columns. I have that uh, computed here. B transpose is this other matrix, 1, 1, 2, 1, 0, 2, 3, minus 1, 1. Probably should have gotten that onto the previous page. Here was the original matrix B. And I'll flip back. Here's B transpose. Now, in the original matrix, and again, I'll flip back here, player two gets to choose columns and receives a positive number payout of the amount shown, depending on which row player one picks. If we look at B transpose, we can... The, the columns player two picked in the original matrix B correspond to rows being picked in B transpose. So if we treat this as the matrix for a zero sum game, and we ask what player one strategies and and if we ask what player one's optimal strategies are in this game, that will correspond to player two's optimal strategies in the original matrix B. Because player one wants to pick a row here to maximize uh, the 
guaranteed return, to find the largest return that can be guaranteed for player one that's picking the rows. And remember, that will be like a player picking columns in this original game B and maximizing the return, which is what we want here since uh, now we want the biggest number for player two. So let's look at B transpose again. If we think of this as a zero sum game and we ask what is the best player one can guarantee, we just need to solve this game. And again, it's not difficult because again, I've chosen a very simple example where we have a saddle point one here. This number one is the smallest number in the first row and it's the largest number in that second column. So by playing row one here, player one can guarantee a return of at least one. And that's the best player one can do because this player two, and this is a mythical player two because even what I've been calling player one corresponded to our original player two, but whatever we would think of as a player two in this new matrix game, thought of as a zero sum game, could prevent the player one from getting any more than $1 as a return by picking column two. So what were the results? Let me, I'm sorry, go back here. <clears throat> For pl the player one in our original non-zero sum game, our general sum game, the value of game A was one, and that could be achieved by player one picking row two. For player two, we saw that when we looked at B transpose, the player one in B transpose wanted to pick row one, which corresponds to player two, who gets this return matrix B, picking column one here. And what does that tell us? Let's go to the end here. That tells us, this is the exact same game listed here, our general sum game. That tells us if both players play these strategies, and these strategies are what we call the max-min strategies or safety level strategies, each player can guarantee him or herself at least a payout of one by picking the safety level strategies. And there's no higher number that either player can guarantee regardless of the choice of the, the opponent. If both players pick those safety level strategies, we'll end up at this point in the game. Player one will pick row two, player two We'll pick column one, and each will get a return of exactly one. Now, here are the type of questions we're going to be asking over the course of the next week or two. Is this really a good outcome for the game? Well, there are going to be some senses in which the answer is yes, and other senses in which the answer is no. And they depend on whether this game is a cooperative game or a non-cooperative game. So the, the study of two-player non-zero-sum games, just general-sum games, <clears throat> really depends a lot on whether the players are even allowed to cooperate. If they're allowed to cooperate, let me tell you, they can do a lot better than both getting return of one. They can look at this here and say, look how much better the payouts are here if player one just plays row three and player two plays column two. We really wish we'd get a payout of four here for player one and two for player two. That's better, it's strictly better for both players. I wish we would do this. But neither one has an incentive to change from this situation, unless they're allowed to cooperate. If they could cooperate, they should say, let's go here. And then there's a separate issue if they cooperate, should player one get this, the payout of $4 and player two just get $2? Should they share it and get three each? By Should they make an agreement to, to choose row three and column two and split it to three each? What should they do? What would their incentives be to do any move different from this one here, the row two, column one, which only gets them $1 each? So these are questions we'll talk about later. If they're not actively cooperating, do they have any incentive to move to this strategy? Well, they both know that they can get their safety level of one by playing row two and column one and getting to this point right here. 
if player two thinks player one is going to play row two, because that's player one's safety strategy, what will player two want to do? Well, player two gets either one dollar, zero dollars, and negative one dollars. Player two will have every incentive to just stay along with column one. If player one thinks player two is going to play column one, what should player one do? Well, player one would get either zero, one, or minus one. So player two has an incentive to stick with row two. In other words, if they each think the other is going to play this particular if each thinks the other is going to play that particular strategy that we've been talking about, the safety level strategy, row two for player one, column one for player two, then neither one has any incentive to switch to a different strategy. That will make, and we'll be talking about this a lot more later, that will make this position in the matrix what we call a strategic equilibrium. If they're at this position or they think that they'll get to this position, neither player, neither player one nor player two, has an incentive to move his own, to change his own move without any sort of agreement that the other player will also go along and change the move. Now, this is stuff, I'll just uh, give you a quick spoiler, this is stuff uh, <clears throat> that was studied by John Nash, who actually proved that in every finite two-player general sum game, strategic equilibria exist. There exists at least one strategic equilibrium. We'll see examples later that can be multiple strategic equilibria in a game. Here we have just this one. And so Nash proved that these always exist, and later, after this work, for which he got a Nobel Prize in economics, and later a movie made about him, <coughs> uh, we started calling these Nash equilibria, though our book sticks with the term strategic equilibrium, which is what Nash used, of course. He didn't name them after himself. That came later, as chosen by other people. So these are all the issues. This is where we're going with the topic. Uh, we will continue with this in the subsequent video lectures.